Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Some friends and I were camping in Yosemite Park in the fall. At about 10 p.m., we were in our sleeping bags in the tent talking when all the animal sounds going on around us suddenly went quiet. Then we heard a loud, low scream that gradually ended in a high pitch. All of us sat up and were asking the usual question, what was that? Then, as we waited in our tents, we heard other campers from around the lake talking and walking our way. When we looked out of the tent, we saw that they had all their stuff with them and were leaving in a hurry. We asked them what that noise was, and they asked us if we had seen the thing run by our campsite. We were too scared to notice, I guess. We watched a special on cable this morning about Bigfoot, and when they played the vocalizations of what is believed to be a Bigfoot, I got scared all over again this many years later. The only difference was that what we heard ended in an abrupt higher pitch. There was a foul smell, kind of like a dirty dog. It was next to Tenya Lake with a mountain next to the lake. The sound came from the side of the mountain and then apparently the thing came running down by the campsite. On to the next one. It was January, and little Ruben Rios and Danny Morales had taken Ruben Hernandez, my husband, into taking them snow camping. Ruben had the experience and the equipment, but was reluctant, because neither Rios nor Danny had much camping experience and had never camped in the snow. But winter camping prevailed, and they ended up on the border of the Stanislaus National Forest and the west side of Yosemite National Park, a place that was called Carl's Inn and then later renamed Carolyn. It is located on the south fork of the Tulamine River on Evergreen Road. The road was open in winter, possibly due to the fact that it's on the way to Hetchley Reservoir. It's not too far on the map from Highway 120 and Yosemite's Big Oak Flat entrance station. It is about 4,575 feet elevation. Camping is not allowed there anymore, but we still fish there in the spring and summer. Carillon is in a narrow valley with ridges on both sides, and the road drops quite a bit on the highway and the stream. The men had gotten off to a late start because of work, so whatever they could pile into Ruben's Jeep in just a few minutes is what they took. After a while, it was getting dark, and Highway 120 was deserted, and they hadn't even seen another car since Buck Meadows. The temperature had dropped, and all three agreed to pull over and set up camp next to a level spot, which happened to be an old logging camp road next to a bridge. That's how they found Carillon. It was not their original destination, just a convenient place off the road. Night had come, and it was pitch black by the time they got parked, they left the Jeep on a 45-degree uphill angle on the logging road and blocked its tires with the biggest rocks they could lift. There were no signs that anyone had been there for a long time. No garbage in the empty can or even footprints in the snow. When they realized they had forgotten their firewood, they had no choice but to try to find some in the forest. This was no easy task because snow was on the ground and everything was either wet or frozen. So they ended up pruning the trees in the National Forest. The point being that these three guys were making a lot of noise, tromping around and using their axes, going up the mountain to the top of the ridge, chopping and then dragging tree branches down the mountainside by lantern light. The fire was made in the campsite firing with much effort. After siphoning some gas out of the Jeep, they had a good fire going and dinner was ready to be prepared. Mostly canned foods like Vienna sausages, 
and dinty more stew set directly onto the fire. Unfortunately, the dinty more stew can exploded and sprayed food all over them and a 13-foot diameter circle around the fire. This is important to what happened later. After eating what was left of dinner, the three fell asleep inside their tent. At about 2.30 or 3 a.m., the three campers suddenly awoke to the sound of the crunch, crunch footsteps of a Bigfoot in the snow and brush. Then they heard puffing and snorting and grunting from a creature that sounded like a cross between a gorilla and a pig. And then that was followed by blood-curdling screams. It was coming from the ridge above the campground. And then more crunch, crunch, walking footsteps and screams. It was walking around the camp along the ridge where they had been earlier that evening, getting their illegal wood. The three men froze with fear. The thing was coming closer. They could hear the thing encircling their campsite. They knew they were in big trouble. Reuben recalls that it was such a horrible sounding scream, it gave him goosebumps all over. But he needed to keep his wits together because the other two were looking to him for answers. He never let on that he was just as scared as they were of whatever it was that was looming over their camp. He also remembers as all this was happening, his mind was racing with the thought, my God, this thing is going to kill us right here, right now. This is how I'm going to die. When the spring thaw comes, someone is going to find the remains of what was left of our camp. Shreds of tent material, ripped up sleeping bags, dented pots and pans, busted up camping supplies, and the dead remains of whatever is left of us. Reuben tried to get the other two to be quiet and calm down. He remembered telling them, whatever is out there can hear every sound we are making. Shut up. One just broke down and cried hysterically, repeating over and over, we are going to die, we are going to die. That thing is going to kill us, we are going to die. The other was asking in a freaked out voice, what is it, Reuben? Let's get out of here. Let's get in the Jeep and get out of here. Reuben told them there was no way they'd be able to get the rock away from the tires fast enough. The thing was so close. And even if they could, driving backward on black ice could roll the Jeep. Reuben told them they would be better off in the tent and remain quiet and wait to see what would happen next. It screamed that way four separate times about five to ten minutes in between each scream, and was in the campground for about an hour. Reuben had his twenty-two caliber revolver, but no one would move to see what was out there. They were just waiting for whatever it was to attack their tent. The moon had risen, and they could see the shadows of swaying tree branches through the nylon of the tent. The gun was pointed in the direction of the sound, Reuben swore that whatever it was out there was going to cast its shadow down on them with its hairy arms outstretched, swoop down, and yank them out of the tent, tearing everything into shreds. Reuben knew what all the usual forest animals sounded like. He had been a boy scout and a hunter and a fisherman for years. He had seen and heard bobcat and cougar and even chased an angry bear, but he had never experienced anything like this before. He just knew that it was heavy and loud and was walking around on two feet. The crunching and crashing sound was moving along the ridge now, just grunting as it slowly walked away without screaming anymore. Then it seemed to cross over the other side of the ridge very slowly with an occasional fading gorilla-like grunt. The campsite was quiet again. The rest of the night, the three men took turns staying up holding the gun and keeping watch inside the tent while the other two tried to sleep. When the sky was just beginning to show signs of daylight, the three grabbed all their gear, threw it into the jeep, and left without breakfast. They didn't see any animal tracks around their camp and definitely didn't want to go toward the ridge to look for any either. They were in too much of a hurry to get out of there. They didn't talk about it much on the way home and didn't tell anyone why they were home so early that morning. It's been a long time since that happened, and one of the two guys will not talk about it. He claims that Reuben is crazy and made up the whole story. Reuben says that guy doesn't want him to talk about it because 
He does not want the story getting out that he panicked and was hysterically crying. The other guy still calls Reuben every other Christmas to wish him a good holiday and always ends his conversation with Reuben. Do you think that thing that we heard when we went camping was a Bigfoot? Reuben always replies, I don't know. We never saw it. It could have been. But in my husband's mind and heart, he knows it was. On to the next one. In Monroe County in Kentucky, there exists a location called Monkey Cave Hollow. The name was given by early settlers and referred to a strange tribe of monkeys which inhabited the area, living in caves and foraging for roots and berries. These critters were hunted to their apparent extinction with the last of them reportedly shot and killed around the turn of the 20th century. This is really true. Whatever it was that Uncle Benton saw, he never did know. It was back about 1900 when there was a lot of log hauling. He had to pass a place that was claimed to be haunted around the Bray Schoolhouse. He was working back there on Gilbert Maxey Place or Harv Walden or someplace cutting logs. And this particular night was really dark when he came through there. Said he always felt a little skittish coming through there after night. He would always turn three of his mules loose and ride one. Between the Bray Schoolhouse and the John Fish Place was where his lead mules got scared at something and were coming back a meeting him. He tried to head them off, said he couldn't head them, and they come on around the Bray Schoolhouse and out to Aunt Maddie Harris's place and around a different road and come on home. He tried to make the mule that he was riding go up past the place there. He happened to look out, and there in front of him, he could see something black laying there. He thought probably it was a big hog or something like that, but still, he couldn't get his mule by it, and he said he was a little bit afraid since he had heard so many tales about the place to get down from his mule and investigate, and so he just turned and followed the other mules around. But he went back there the next morning, said he'd come to this place, and there was a mud hole there. And on this bank there, he said there couldn't anything have laid up on this bank there where he saw a hog or anything else. Said it was too rolling and he would have rolled off. And he got down and investigated and he didn't see no tracks of anything. So he finally didn't know what it was. Another bluegrass Bigfoot appeared in Montgomery County on January 30th, 2007, and was once again seen by two passing motorists driving down a lonely back road on Mount Sterling, Kentucky. It was about 6.30 p.m., and we were just coming home from the store, said Blaine. As Blaine and his wife drove down Paris Pike Road, a small country lane, they noticed a tall figure walking down the roadside ahead, which they at first took to be a hitchhiker. We usually don't pick up hitchhikers, he said, but we thought this could be one of our neighbors. Blaine began to slow the car down to a crawl while his wife started to roll down her window. Then the headlight hit the thing fully. It turned around facing them and froze and all thoughts of neighborly kindness were flung away in an instant. There, standing before them was a frightening, two-legged, man-like beast covered with coarse black hair. Worse still, it was seven feet tall, and it had eyes which glowed red in the headlight. We did not know what to do, said the witness, so we sat there for a few seconds in disbelief. We honked the horn, and he took off on two legs. Even when he was gone, you could still smell this horrible stench. The witness claimed that as it ran away, it made a loud grunt, like a deer in mating season, only louder. The area around Mount Sterling seems to be another window area with all manners of high strangeness events being reported there for many decades. From the Bardstown newspaper, November 2nd, 1978. Nelson County, October 1965. The Wardle Short. The hills and hollows of Nelson County 
where this incident took place are normally peaceful spots where farmers nestle tobacco and corn against the ridges and cattle graze the gentle slopes rising from the creek bed. Raccoon hunters pick their way through the woods and step lightly across fence and the crisp autumn nights are usually filled with nothing more fearsome than screech owls or an occasional fox. It was on such a night in October of 1965 that two brothers saw something which they've never forgotten. One says he doesn't tell the incident to many people anymore. They just laugh and call you crazy, he says, but our eyes didn't fool us and neither of them will deny it ever happened. While their father and mother attended a school fall festival that evening, the boys had been instructed to go to their grandmother's farm to find a cow which was expected to have a calf. It was not quite dark, and we'd taken the pickup truck to the back field as far as we could drive, he remembered. The parked truck had headed up a fence row to a clump of trees where the cattle usually bedded at night. As we moved up the fence row, spotted something in sort of a hunched position. There were a lot of buck bushes growing around the field, and we couldn't see too well. We didn't think it was a cow, but we didn't know what else it could be. About a hundred feet away from the object, their dog started barking uncontrollably, and then the animal backed off and would not follow the boys any closer. They were no more than 50 feet away from it by now. All of a sudden, the creature rised up on two legs and began running away from them. It stopped under an arch formed by two trees and, for a moment, faced its pursuers. The brown, hair-covered body stretched seven to eight feet tall. The brothers aimed their flashlight at it once and caught a glowing red reflection from its eyes. We couldn't have watched it for more than a few seconds. Then we both ran off scared to death. I turned once to see if it was chasing us, and I saw the creature put its hand on a fence post and just flip over into the next field. The next day, when their father went out to the field to check their wild story, he found a path through a field of uncut oats in the exact spot where the boys claimed their monster jumped the fence. They never saw the creature again, though once that same year, their mother and sisters heard an unusual noise in the barn. That summer, another unexplained incident happened in a certain corner of their garden something would eat the corn as fast as it came on the stalk. In 1965, few people had ever heard of Bigfoot, but several years later, when one of the boys was in college, he accidentally ran across the account of several Bigfoot sightings in the Northwest. Ever since, I've never doubted that's what we saw that night, he said. We didn't know what a Bigfoot was, so we called it a hortle short. I read everything I can about them, the Bigfoot now, and almost every account that I've read seems to match up with ours. Through his readings, he has also learned that Bigfoot are believed to be vegetarian and very shy of people and other animals. I don't think I'm scared of it, but I never go up in that field at night without thinking an awful lot about what I saw. I believe God created the world through evolution, and maybe what I saw is the missing link between man and apes. Bigfoot returned to Nelson County, this time on Nelsonville Road in Boston, Kentucky. In the late fall of 1978, only one of three witnesses to the event came forward, and this only after 30 years had passed. Myself and two buddies were bow hunting, a tract of land we had used for quite a few years, he stated. This was about a 500-acre patch of hardwood that borders the Kentucky Turnpike. We always camped in an old abandoned barn right off Nelsonville Road, just a few miles out of Boston. It was a cool November afternoon, and we had decided to do some scouting. We had walked a set of railroad tracks about a mile back into the middle of the area we always hunted. We made our way off the tracks and were slowly working through the woods. The area is mainly gentle rolling hills and bottoms. We were spread out about 100 yards apart and had just topped a small ridge. About 200 yards down in the next bottom, something caught my eye. I noticed 
something black moving quickly through the wood, and it was out of sight in a matter of seconds. I thought it was pretty odd as there were no bears in this area of the state back then, and we had never noticed any farm dogs or other livestock this far back in the wood. When we met on the track to head back to camp, I asked my buddies if they had noticed anything strange while scouting, and neither of them had seen anything. I casually mentioned what I had seen and left it at that. Later that evening, back at the barn, we had finished supper and had turned into our sleeping bags to call it a night. It was cool and clear, and the local farmyard dogs were carrying on pretty good, and the caddy did were really putting up a fuss. As the area was really loaded with fox and everything seemed to be pretty active, I decided to try and call one up from inside the barn. I pulled the cellophane off a pack of smokies and squeezed it between my thumb and started a series of calls, sounding like a rabbit in distress. This tactic had worked well for us in the past. This evening, it worked a little too well. After about five minutes of me screaming on the call, the local dogs were really worked up good and sounding off like crazy. What happened next, I'll never forget till the day they lay me in the ground. From way off in the distance, a low moan started up that grew into a loud, mournful roar that sent shivers down my spine. We all sat up in silence for a few seconds and noticed that not a single dog or caddy did was making so much as a peep. The wood had become dead silent. Not believing what we just heard, I let out one more blast of calls from the makeshift varmint call. Again, it started up low and grew into that same kind of roar-like sound. This time, it really put the fear of the Lord in us all. My buddies were begging me to stop, and it really didn't take too much convincing. The hair on the back of my neck and arms was standing straight up and goosebumps had come up all over me. I put the cellophane away and got as deep down in my bag as I could. None of us said another word, and sleep was nearly impossible. We all three lay in the barn, dead silent till morning light. Needless to say, not a one of us dared head out the next morning in the darkness for any deer hunting. We got up, packed, headed out of there as fast as we could. I was 17 or 18 years old at the time and had spent nearly all of this time in the wood and on the water and had never ever heard anything like what we did that night. I'm now much older and have moved off to another state but spend every possible minute I can in the wood. The witness also claimed that years later he heard an alleged Bigfoot recording taken in Columbiana County, Ohio and it sent chills down his spine. It was an exact match. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!